Welcome to the Ketones and Coffee Podcast with Lawrence Manaig, where we explore the ketogenic lifestyle and how it can improve your physical and mental health. Each week, we bring you valuable insights and advice from experts to help you on your journey to a healthier lifestyle. This episode is brought to you by BasicKetogenicLifestyle.com, where Lawrence coaches individuals with depression to reverse their symptoms and achieve a healthier, happier life using an evidence-based approach. So sit back, relax, and join us as we dive deep into the world of ketones and coffee. Subscribe to the Ketones and Coffee podcast today and never miss an episode. I'm Lawrence, and I'm so grateful to have you joining me on this journey. Every week, I bring in guests who have the knowledge and experience to help you on your own journey to a better health. I'm so excited for this. We have a very special guest on a podcast today. Carrie Brown is a renowned food and lifestyle blogger, a best-selling author of keto cookbooks, and a passionate mental health advocate. Carrie has dedicated herself to raising awareness about mental health issues and promoting open conversations around it. Through her talks and interviews, she shares her inspiring story of how she overcame her struggles and achieved a medication-free, symptom-free life with the help of a ketogenic lifestyle. I'm, I'm here with Carrie Brown. Carrie, welcome to the show. Hi, Lawrence. I'm, I'm particularly grateful for you reaching out. I think the, the COVID years, the pandemic, I think a lot of people kind of moved away. A lot of people were struggling with, with eating. A lot of people were stress eating, comfort eating. You know, everything was crazy and upside down and chaotic. And a lot of people lost their, their dietary way. And I completely understand that. And, you know, I wasn't perfect through those years either. There was a few moments where I was like, oh, to heck with it, you know. So I completely understand that and there's no judgment. But the reason I'm so grateful for you is that, you know, you're you're still here because although a lot of people fell off the keto wagon, the keto didn't change, right? Keto didn't suddenly stop working. Keto... But it's, it's lost its place, I think, somewhat in the kerfuffle of COVID. It lost its, its kind of place in the world. And people like you are helping to keep it alive, are helping to, to keep it still be relevant and, and to remind people of how much success they had on keto before COVID came and derailed us all. And, and of course, the other reason I'm so grateful for you is because your focus is not on necessarily on keto for weight loss. It's you're like me in that, you know, any weight loss was a plus, but, but really to let people know that keto is so, so powerful particularly in the mental health space, but also for a whole host of other things, you know, diabetes and, you know, from everything from big things right down to no more skin tags. And, mm -hmm. and you know, there's just so many things that keto is incredibly powerful at resolving. And I've always been not wanting that story, which is amazing as you know from personal experience and I know from personal experience, I don't want that to get lost in the, oh, keto is just for weight loss. So for anyone out there who thinks keto is just synonymous with weight loss, folks like you are, you know, beating that drum of, yeah, weight loss is nice, but look at all these other amazing things that keto can do for you. That was nice. Thank you so much. I'm honored to have you on personally. Because... No, it's really important that the yeah. that people understand that. And that's yeah. what you're doing. And you do this whole podcast, you know, on your own dime, in your own time, you know, outside of your your activities that generate revenue for you. And I know because we, we had a little chat beforehand, but you're like me in that it's just like if we just – help one person to 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 get relief from the sim symptoms of bipolar 2 in my case or or to stop having panic attacks or to you know just one person all of this will have been worth it
And so I really, I'm really grateful for what you're doing, what um, what you give of yourself in order to to genuinely help others. Yeah, that's what it's all about. And this is an amazing experience for me to really have you on because you have such a wealth of knowledge. You have such a an incredible story, and I believe that we can change lives here, Carrie. So I'm thrilled to have you to spread the message here. And in, in addition to Carrie's advocacy, though, I want to point out she also have a fantastic Facebook group. You still have this Facebook group, right? Yep. The Keto Kitchen and yep. Home with Carrie Brown. It's a space for people, guys, to share, learn, and grow and uplift each other. So if you are somebody who struggles to stay on the keto diet, this is a great group to join as you navigate that keto lifestyle. So, and just- I should say that, and and although I'm going to be woke for a minute, you know, it's a safe space. But but what I mean by that is like there's so many Facebook groups that are just really hostile, and you know, you say something that that may seem obvious to someone else, and you just get your head ripped off, or you say something vulnerable mm. and you're attacked my group we don't know you do that and you're out like we don't Mm. do that it's like it truly is a space where you can feel safe Mm. and comfortable there's no like there's no drama yeah (laughs) i love that no drama do not come into my group (laughs) because there's no drama so i just wanted to point that out because so many and even so many of the keto groups were just a lot of them have, have, have disappeared now, but a lot of them were so hostile. And the last thing that anybody needs when they're trying to do something to improve themselves is to be met with hostility or criticism yes. or sarcasm or, you know, that's a yes. dumb question. N- yes. Nobody needs that. Yes. And we all are, you know, in different stages of our journey, right? So we really have to really be cognizant of what we're saying online because it may hurt somebody or you know we don't want to step on anybody's foot here and we are just here to really help each other out and so that's why i appreciate this group so much and again i'll link it down in the description box below so you guys can check that out it's the keto kitchen and home with carrie brown carrie let's get to the story so we understand that your experience with you know depression began at a very young age, and we're thrilled to hear that you've been medication-free, symptom-free since a long, long time ago. And we October, love success stories. Mm-hmm. 2015, October 2015. 2015. So uh, eight, almost eight years. We, yeah. we, we love that. We love success stories here <laughs> on the podcast. And so we'd love for you to share that journey that led to that. So it, it's a long story. So I'm gonna try, <laughs> I'm gonna try and make it manageable, and I might skip over a bit. So if there's anything that that I kind of skip over, feel free to go back. But you were right when when you said that I suffered from depression from a very young age, and I feel like I was born depressed. Um, and I say that because I don't rem- ever remember a time when I was young, when I was very small and when I was growing up, I don't ever remember a time when I felt any differently other than, you know, I, I was always felt like I was walking around with a big cloud on my head. But, but you know, when you're four, you kind of like, well, this is normal. This is all I've ever known. And you don't, you don't have the, the understanding or the experience or the vocabulary to communicate anything about I mean I didn't know it was depression I didn't know that it was odd I didn't know that I shouldn't be feeling that way that's just how it was it was when I later on as I kind of got towards teen years and then I started to figure out because of the way my family and people around me treated me I began to figure out that the how I was was not normal and the depression was not normal. But again, nobody diagnosed me with depression. I was just the problem child. I was just the troublemaker. I was just pouty or tantrumy or, you know, whatever bad negative label they could put on me because I 
you can probably tell from my accent, I didn't grow up in America. So I, I grew up in England. And, and although I, as I understand it, I've been gone 20 years, but as I understand it, you know, mental health is less of a stigma there now than it was. But when I was growing up and right up until I left 20 years ago, the stigma around mental health was enormous. Like nobody ever admitted to going to therapy. Mm. You know, you never, you were considered to be really broken if you mm. ever went to therapy. So I started to realize something wasn't right, but I was labeled as being, you know, a problem child, as being, you know, grumpy, as being obnoxious, like all the negative things. What actually, what it was, was that I was suffering from this massive clinical depression. And so I, I didn't have any support. I was just left like sitting there as a teenager going, I know there's something wrong with it, me. My parents are telling me that I'm just an awful human, <laughs> like, like that I'm just difficult and, and like just pull yourself together and all of those other things. But I had no, no understanding of like what it was because every time I tried to be better, and, and you'll know because you've suffered from depression, you can't, you can't, you know, behave your way out of a depression. It's like you can't think your way out of a broken arm. Yeah. Like you, you can't, you can't do that. Mm -hmm. So as I got, after I, I went to university in London and I actually start, I put myself in therapy unbeknown to my parents or, or, and actually outside of my main medical people, I started seeing a counselor at the university and that was the first time where I kind of thought, oh, you, you know, it, it's me. There's something wrong with me, but there's something tangible wrong with me rather than I'm just a difficult child. But I, when when things really really started to change for me was like so I went through a long 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 time not really knowing what to do not having any support just kind of winging it just and, and I learned that and I think you've had this experience too that you you learn to smile <laughs> you learn to hide the depression because being depressed out in the world brings you nothing good. <laughs> like when you go to work, if you want to keep your job, you don't show your depression. You don't, you know, you can't be you. You have to perform when you're in public because nobody yeah. wants to be a depressed person. Nobody wants a, a depressed person there. Nobody. And goodness me, if you mentioned that you have suicidal episodes, like, you know, that's a career limiting thing. So I learned to perform in public, but in private, you know, I was on the couch with a bottle of alcohol just to kind of get through because I didn't know how else to get through. So fast forward a lot of years, I became very depressed about 15 years ago and I and I was diagnosed with unipolar depression so regular depression and I was put on an antidepressant which did nothing good for me I don't remember what happened but over the course of a year they tried me on five different antidepressants for you know the regular antidepressants that we always hear about all of them had really bad side effects. Like one of them made me violent, like throwing furniture across the room violent. And I'm not a violent person. One of them made me suicidal. There was everyone they tried. None of them resolved the depression. And all of them gave mm. me really bad side effects. The last one they put me on gave me 24 by 7 panic attacks mm -hmm. for which was I literally thought I had lost my mind. I didn't sleep for six weeks. I was a complete mess. 
Like every time I, I heard a car outside, I was convinced it was the police coming to take me away and put me in jail for whatever. I mean, it was really crazy making. And at the end of that six weeks, even triple dose Ambien did not make me sleep. So after six weeks, I was like, I just, I, I can't do this anymore. So I stopped all of the antidepressants and the, the panic attack stopped, thankfully. And I was able to go back to sleep, thankfully. But I think I decided at that point that living with the depression and, and acting my way through life and kind of, you know, dragging myself through life behind the scenes was better than the year that I'd had on antidepressants. So that was at the point I decided, you know, it is what it is. I'm just going to have to suck it up and make the best of it and keep it a secret. And, and so I did that for about seven years. I don't know my math, six years, somewhere around there, a long time. And then in March ish, April of 2013, I had a, a, a mental break and I ended up under armed guard in handcuffs at the, at the local ER. And I almost in, in Washington state where I was living at the time, I'm in Connecticut now, but in Washington state, it is illegal to commit suicide. And so if you threaten to commit suicide, which I had done, they have the right to put you on a involuntary two week hold i.e they can lock you up for two weeks without your permission without they can just mm. do that and and that was the point at which i realized that if i didn't get myself out of that situation life was going to go very sideways very fast because i was single you know i i had a I was working for Microsoft, so I had a very responsible job. I had a bunch of cats. I had a house. I had, like, if, if I'd have disappeared for two weeks, my whole life would have gone seriously sideways. So I managed to talk my way out of a two-week involuntary hold. The conditions of them letting me go were... Obviously, they contacted my then therapist and and talked to him. And they had to release me to a friend who took me home. I had to agree to psychiatric evaluation. And then I had to agree to see a psychiatrist like every week for, I, I, I don't remember. Anyway, there were a lot of conditions, but I managed to get myself out of the hospital. And then started the kind of the merry-go-round which anyone who has been diagnosed with mental health disorder will know so i had the psychiatric evaluation that was when they diagnosed me with bipolar 2 disorder which is when the nightmare from from pre earlier in my life became apparent because if you have bipolar 2 and you're given antidepressants for unipolar depression, bad things happen, which is exactly what I had experienced. So now that was kind of making sense. So having been diagnosed with bipolar 2 disorder, they then started this crazy thing that psychiatrists do, which is they go, okay, you have, we're going to put you in this little box labeled bipolar 2 because you have symptoms that are similar to all of these other people and we label you bipolar too. So we're going to put you in that box and then we're going to see, okay, a lot of people in your box respond well to this drug. So we're going to give you this drug. Mm. So they put me on that drug for two weeks and I was almost in a coma. I was like, it was like the zombie apocalypse had arrived, but only to my house. And, and I had, a responsible job at Microsoft and I had to support myself. And I was like, after two weeks, I was like, I, I can't, like, I can't, I can barely function. So then they put me on something else and then that, and then they put me on something else and then they put me on, on something else. But nine months after that, I became suicidal. So 24 by seven suicide, I actually had to take a three month medical leave 
and they're still trying me on drugs and this, and I'm still seeing the psychiatrist every week. And after eight months of being suicidal, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, I I got really mad and I'm like, this is like, this is ridiculous. I'm on these drugs. I can barely function. Mm -hmm. I'm suicidal. So I took myself off everything. I'm like, if I'm going to be suicidal, I'll be suicidal without the drugs. Like mm, yeah. why, why am I medicating myself and taking these drugs that we don't really know what they're going to do to my brain and I'm still yeah. suicidal, so I'm going to take myself off them. So I did. And I went to a regular doctor and he asked me to – try he wasn't a psychiatrist but he had a lot of experience with mental health from his from his own family and he said i would like you to try lamotrigine and you'll see why this is important later i'd like you to try lamotrigine so we put me on, on lamotrigine and seriously lorenz it was like somebody turned the light on it was like within three days i felt joy for probably the first time in my life. Mm. And it was magical. And for six months, like literally like somebody turned the light on and everything was fabulous. And then six months after I started, I became suicidal. One day I just woke up and I became suicidal. And, and, and so they doubled the dose of the Lamotrigine and the lights came back on and life was magical. And then six months later, I became suicidal and their response was, we're going to double the dose. And that was the point at which I got really, really like upset. And I said, this is BS. I'm sorry, but like, I can't spend the rest of my life wondering when the other shoe's going to drop and having you double the dose. I just, I can't, this is not a fix. This is not a solution. I can't, what if one day when I become suicidal and I'm in a bad place where I actually do something, like I, I can't live like this. So I fired everybody, psychiatrists, I didn't fire my psychotherapist, but everybody else, I fired a lot of them and I decided that nobody was asking the critical question. And the critical question was, why does Carrie have bipolar? Mm. Nobody was asking why I had yep. bipolar. Mm -hmm. Was it genetic? Was it environmental? Was it the food I was eating? Was it like, you know, nature versus nurture? Was I born broken? Was it the way my parents raised me, treated me? like? Was it a combination of all of that? But nobody was asking that. They were just saying, you have these symptoms and this drug will stop those symptoms. Mm. That's not what I wanted. I wanted to not be bipolar. Yep. But, but what, what the medical profession will tell you, and I was told this very loudly and given books to read about how you can't cure bipolar, you just have to learn to live with it, you know, and oh, it's really not that bad. You might not be out of vacation how you'd like, but that's okay. You can get used to it. And you may not be able to do the job you want, but that's okay. You'll get used to it. You'll find a job where you can make it work. And I'm like, hell no. Like, what? But that's yeah. what the medical profession, the psychiatrists, the books, that's the message that I got. Mm. And I'm like, I just, I don't subscribe to this. I, I need to know why I have bipolar. And so I fired everybody. And the first thing I did was I spat in a tube and I sent off for my DNA because it, it what made sense to me was that you should kind of knock off the thing. If you've got a list of possible things that are causing you to have symptoms, what, what are the things that you can knock off the most easily? And for me, genetics was the least variable because your DNA is your DNA. So I figured I'd start with, with the known, the non-variable, which was my DNA. 
And around the same time as I sent off for my DNA, I bumped into Dr. Ted Naiman mm. on Twitter. And it turned out that he, his office was like 11 miles from my house in Seattle. And, and we met. And he said to me on Twitter, this is on DMs on Twitter, like I said to him, do you know anything about genetics? Because I'm getting my DNA and I have bipolar. I'm trying to figure this out. And Anyway, we went to Starbucks. We had coffee. He said, I think I can help you with your bipolar. Wow. And so I'm like, I'm not looking for a free ride. And I work for Microsoft. You know, I can pay you. So I made an appointment at, at his office and I went down. And he was actually the one who said, I want to put you on the ketogenic diet. Mm. Now, here's where the lamotrigine comes in. Lamotrigine is an anti-seizure medication. And so Dr. Naiman's point was the ketogenic diet was originally developed for children who were having seizures, and it was incredibly successful in either stopping the seizures altogether or making them a a lot better. No, seizures Mm. don't get better. Making them a lot less bad and he said so it makes sense to me that if you respond well to an anti-seizure medication that you might respond as well to an anti-seizure diet which is is how the ketogenic diet was originally developed so i'm like okay so i start he put me on the ketogenic diet and and it was hardcore like it was like our you know when people used to pee on on P6. Mm-hmm. <laughs> our, our goal was to have purple P tones, like to get that. But but the so if you if you're do, doing keto for weight loss, you don't have to worry about that. Mm-hmm. But for me, we were trying to brain to brain bathe my brain in ketones. So we were looking for super high ketone levels. So I was peeing on sticks every day, and my my pitos were really like dark purple. And at the same time, I got my DNA back. And it turns out that I have a, a genetic wrinkle mm-hmm. called MTHFR. One of the, so one of my genes is expressing myself with this MTHFR. What that means is, one of the things that means is that I cannot methylate properly my my body cannot methylate very well methylation there's a lot of process in our body that require require methylation and i'm just not very good at it genetically why that's in super important in in mental health is that b vitamins require when we eat b vitamins we can't use them we have to methylate them first. Now I can't do that. Oh. So, <laughs> so I'm like, this is why I've. I, and so the number one function of B vitamins are neurotransmitter health. Mm. So I had basically spent my whole life. Wow. With no B vitamins because I, I and no matter how many I ate, I couldn't do anything with them. Mm. So I just peed them out. So, and actually I had, I was doing a whole bunch of other testing at the same time. And at the same, so at the same time I'd had all these blood tests. I mean, like crazy number of blood tests, to try and work out, okay, what is in my blood that shouldn't be? What isn't in my blood that should be? Levels of everything, like every blood test you can imagine, I was having them all done. And I had no B vitamins. Like mm. all of my B vitamins were like critically low like nothing so the the blood test corroborated the fact that the, the, wow. the dna test said you know we have mthfr so you can't methylate mm. so i found that out as well i i also found out that i do have a genetic sensitivity to gluten so taking gluten out which of course keto we don't have gluten kind of by definition because everything that gluten is in is very carby mm-hmm. So the other thing that this MTHFR gene means is that I am really bad. My liver's 
really not good at detoxifying. So, you know, for all of those people out there that just like laugh at people doing cleanses and detoxing is not a thing. Well, for a third of the population who can't do it very well, those things are vitally important if you know that you can't do it. So I'm one of those people. So I get very, so toxic environments or toxic food, all of that. I'm not very good at clearing it. So it tends to all build up in my body. So the MTH of our gene is super, super important. And what what's crazy about it, and, and on the one hand, I used to get really angry that I'd got that far in life and nobody had mm. talked to me about MTHFR before, but also really grateful that I had found out at that point yeah. because the, the fix for the MTHFR was they actually make B vitamins that are pre-methylated. You can buy methylated B vitamins. So for $30 a month. That's it. That was it. <laughs> Instead of the $1,300 a month I was spending on Lamotrigine was replaced by cutting out carbs, mm -hmm. cutting out industrial seed oils, and taking methylated B vitamins. Wow. That was it. Wow. And and I, so Lamotrigine is a weird kind of drug. I was on Ted Naiman's like super hardcore keto for I think three months. And I was on the methylated B vitamins for six weeks of that, the last six weeks of that three months. And then Dr. Naiman said to me, okay, you can just stop your Lamotrigine. And, and honestly, I was terrified because that fear of slipping into suicidality and so he said if you're not if you don't want to do that then we'll, we'll just we'll titrate it down so we did that over two or three weeks and that was in october was 2015. wow that's amazing and i have not been medicated since and i have had no symptoms of bipolar in that time that's amazing and rest is history. I want to point out also the words that keeps pop popping out of my head is the bigger the struggle, the bigger the calling is I believe that that has been your, <laughs> your message here. And the fact that you've the question that you were you asked yourself, there was why aren't people not asking the question of why does Carrie have bipolar? And then that yeah. question, that curiosity now led you to getting your DNA test and then now actually figuring out that you cannot methylate B vitamins, right? Right, right. Which led to you finding out about that supplement that does that methylated B vitamins. And with the ketogenic diet and you're finding this out that there is actually a cure and you know what really strikes strikes me is when you started your antidepressants when you were diagnosed with unipolar, that's when your suicidal thoughts started. And whenever you're on a drug, you're, from what I'm hearing, was when you're when it gets it actually gets worse. Worse, right? Right. Right. Yeah. yeah. So it's just like I have obviously I love Dr. Naiman. He's like a god. And I'm super sad that I moved to Connecticut because he doesn't get to be my doctor anymore. But honestly, I've barely had need of a doctor since October twenty fifteen. Mm. I do not have a doctor. I've I've lived in Connecticut for five years and I still do not have a doctor here because I haven't needed one which is another like big win mm -hmm. for the keto diet. Mm -hmm. It's like, there is nothing. The only thing I needed help with was I did, I got Lyme disease, which from ticks after I moved here, 
But that's another thing that the mainstream medical profession can't help you with anyway. So I went to a homotoxicologist who treated me homopathically and got rid of the Lyme. But outside of that Mm -hmm. and and having a ridiculous accident with a soap dispenser, I haven't needed any. So I still don't have a doctor. Five years, I take no medications. I haven't taken any medications at all yeah, for yeah, I can't imagine over twenty fifteen. Yeah. Like like the money I have saved on psychiatry, medications, not just the, the bipolar ones, but but other medications that, that I might have needed for other things. Like there's been nothing. My medical bills have been pretty much zero Hmm. since October 2015, where I was spending, or rather Microsoft on my behalf, was spending an average of $39,000 a year on healthcare for me when I worked for them. And it was reduced to pretty much zero. Yeah. So right there, think of the the yeah. money, like just through changing what I eat. Yeah. And taking a supplement that needs to be processed before I take it because I can't yeah. do that processing myself. You basically cure yourself. I mean, you know, yeah. and and people have an issue with 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 me saying I've cured my bipolar because they say, well, if you top, stop taking methylated Bs and and you stop eating keto, then you're going to have bipolar again. And I'm like, well, if I fell off the wall and broke my leg yeah. and I healed my leg, but then I fell off the same wall, I'm going to break my leg well, again. But your- are you going <laughs> to tell me that I didn't heal my leg in the interim? <laughs> like, Yeah, at the, you know, at the end of the day, you were the person who discovered it. Right. And, and, and so, but they, they say that, you know, I'm not healed from it, but that's just Mm. the most, from, from my perspective, that's just the most ridiculous. Like how long do you have to be symptom free? (laughs) Right. Have I been symptom free for eight years? Yeah. Yeah. I could pretty much say that that's healed. Right. I I can't, I can't put my hand on my heart and say I am bipolar. I don't know where those. I have had no symptoms from. for eight years. Like, do you know what yeah. I mean? I, where are they coming would from? I say that? Right. Like, where are they coming from? I mean, you've experienced it. You lived it, and you've rid yourself of it. What do you call it? Right. Well, you know, controversially, <laughs> the the medical profession, the majority of the medical profession, don't want me to have resolved it. Yeah. They don't want me to have healed it because they've lost $39,000 a year of revenue from me. They like me better when I have bipolar. Mm. I am, I am, I am not useful to them. Let's talk about that. It, it it appears as though the system just throws medications at you. You know, there's throwing drugs after drugs, hoping and praying that it works. You know, doesn't sound very promising and, I can imagine, you know, it must be a frightening place when you were there. So we, we can't expect individuals who suffer from it themselves to understand what they have. How often are people given the wrong medications, right? Like if you were diagnosed think- with unipolar and that's not even what you have. Right. Right. I think so. And again, I, do I want to be controversial? No, but I'm going to be anyway. Um, <laughs> you can. Uh, I, I, I feel like, and and particularly with regard to food, I feel like doctors are trained to diagnose symptoms and then find a drug to stop the symptoms. They're not diagnosed. They're not trained to find root cause mm-hmm. and treat the disease. Dirty. That they're not about root cause; they're about treating the symptom. And in my mind, that's where it all goes wrong. We're, they, we're all, unless those of us that are so weird and so obnoxious like me that we've gone out and and used alternative medicine or found like woo things, 
everybody else is is held at a at a level of at an acceptable level of sickness one that they can live with so that the the prescriptions they've taken keep them at a level of sickness that they are prepared to live with mm-hmm. but they're not actually treating they're not resolving the problems i mean obviously with things like broken legs they're resolving the problem there are some things like you know if you have a heart valve breaks they can fix it mm-hmm. so that that's not what i'm talking about i'm talking about the things that they treat with medications that just bring people back to an acceptable level of sickness mm-hmm. if you have known what you know now how would you do it differently for those people who oh, are there right now my i cannot i think about this sometimes and and some, sometimes i stop myself thinking about it because i just get angry my life how different my life would have been if when because a third of the people born have the mthfr gene they just don't know it if you if you look up if you research mthfr and see all of the things that are related to this gene not working properly it's staggering and a third of us have this gene that isn't working properly why don't they just test for it when a baby's born mm. like it would be so simple Yeah. And then put them on methylated B vitamins. Like I can't I I it's too big yeah. for me to imagine what my life would have been like had I not been depressed, clinically depressed mm. for most of my life. Like everything my whole life would have been different in a in a much in a, in a profoundly more positive way. And again, I'm when I think about that sometimes I'm like really angry. Yeah. Like, why did nobody know this? Why why did I have to find this out on my own? Like, why is nobody doing anything about this? But on the other hand, I did find out when I did, and now I've had, you know, nearly eight years of joy. Mm. So I'm I'm super grateful that I went through that struggle and I'm super grateful that I'm annoying and obnoxious and I rattled a lot of cages because I I could have had another 8 years of being suicidal or I could have had another 8 yeah. years of misery and I haven't I've had 8 years of joy and you know or I probably actually honestly I wouldn't have survived another 8 years mm. under what I was going through Let's get to help. How how sh- how will people find this information if they're at in your shoes bef- years ago and looking for a cure or just confused? How do they find this information? How do they know to test for this? Where do they go? What do they ask their doctors? Well, let's get to help them right now. If they come across this recording and they heard so your I- story. Okay. I think and for, for my advice would be for anybody that is struggling with mental health go test for the MTHFR. That that would be my first now my go to. And my website is carrybrown.com. If you go to carrybrown.com and you type in DNA an, an article will come up which will show you exactly what i did like step by step easy click this is what i did to get from there to here where i am now there's the the video of me talking at ketocon 2017 and then there's the the all of the steps that i did because it's very confusing and there's a lot out there and there's a lot of people who don't want you to know this stuff so go to my website type dna click on that article mm. and all of the mm. steps are there with links to make it super easy for you i would and yeah the the you know the 23 and me thing and you th- there's two versions you need you you only need the cheaper version you don't need the the one that says you know dna plus health 
You actually don't need that. The plus health bit is just reports that I have found completely unuseful. You just need the, your DNA mm. file. So it's the cheaper one. If you have mental health struggles, from the thousands of people that have contacted me over year over the years, either met me in person or emailed me or messaged me or talked to me, however, the thousands of people who have said, I tested, I, I, I've, I'm depressed or I have bipolar or I have all mental health issues. I two things. One, I tested for MTHFR, and you were right, I do have it. And two, the ketogenic diet changed my mental health status. Mm. Like thousands of people. So get, you know. Give up something else to get yourself the sixty nine dollars to get that twenty three and me test done. Mm. Because that for me, plus keto, those two things together literally changed my life. And and I would bet a large amount of money on the fact that I would not be alive mm. today. I know that sounds dramatic, but it was really dramatic. I would not be alive today had those two things not happened. Mm, I love it. I believe it. I believe that you are changing lives here. Carrie, carriebrown.com. If you want to look it up, I'm going to also link that in the description box below. So you guys can check that out right now, get your DNA tested and find that out. Find that out. First of all, if you have mental health issues, L love, love when you said keto be synonymous to good health, not just weight loss. We started we started with this on this podcast, but I love this statement here. Not just weight loss. Why, why do you, you say know, that, so? that? That 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 that's been my the drum I've been beating mm -hmm. because I think it it is human nature that you know we all want to lose weight. Most people get to the point at some place where they want to lose weight, and so I think and, and because keto for a lot of people is unbelievably successful at helping people lose weight. People that have tried everything else, keto worked for them to lose weight. And it's something you can do long term. Mm -hmm. So I, it, it's so successful at helping people lose weight that I feel like out in the mainstream, it has become oh, keto is just for weight loss. Right. And and the message of, of all the other things it can do are by the wayside. Mm -hmm. uh, my friend Amy Berger, I don't know if you've had her yeah, on yeah. your podcast. She wrote The Alzheimer's Antidote. Unbelievably yes. helpful resource for people who are struggling with Alzheimer's, which they're, they're calling, you know, type 3 diabetes, mm -hmm. Right, but it's all mental stuff. Mm -hmm. Like it, it's keto. I I just don't want keto to become a another weight loss diet that they can forget about. Right? So much more. But I, I I worry about the number of people who've heard of keto who only have heard of it in terms of weight loss mm. that they have. So they dismiss it. Yes. They, the, the, all, all the, the people out there that aren't looking for weight loss, but are struggling with mental health issues, don't know to look at keto. And that's like my passion is making sure that the, the keto doesn't just fall into the weight loss bucket. And people miss the extraordinary results that people with mental health issues and other health issues can get just by changing what they eat. I love that. And, you know, for me, like I said in the beginning, or maybe before we started recording, I said, if I had Googled keto, I probably wouldn't have, you know, gone through it because of all of the contradicting information about it but 
what I did, if you're looking to start it, you know, look look into Carrie Brown's CarrieBrowns.com story or somebody who who you can resonate with. Reach out to those people, you know, talk to them. They're, you know, you find that they'll like what you did, Carrie, with Ted Naiman, how mm-hmm. he responded to you, how he was quick to let you know that this might help you. People are very nice when you approach them in an, in a very respectful way. And, you know, you'll find out that you, you'll find out about the information that you're looking for. The other thing, the other thing I think about Dr. Naiman is that, that he's a, you know, a family practice. So he doesn't, all the, the stuff he does with, with keto and online and, and his website, he's like you and I, none of that is how he makes money. Like he does that as kind of like this yeah, voluntary that tells you a lot. service to humanity, right? So for me, and I, I think right before the couple of years before COVID came, there were so many people that jumped on the co- on the keto bandwagon because they saw it as a way to make money. And mm. those aren't the people you want to follow. You yeah. you want to find the people who have had an experience with it or, you know, are doing it because their passion for helping others not that they're saying this because their paycheck depends on it. Now my right. paycheck doesn't yeah. depend on it. I you can see behind me my yeah. my I am a commercial food photographer. I shoot for Keto Chow who are the best people in the world. I think you met them at KetoCon. Oh, um, I love it. Yeah. I use their electrolytes. Uh, so supplements. I shoot I do yeah. all of their product yeah photography for keto chow really? but i also develop keto recipes for keto chow and i mm. shoot i develop recipes and then i shoot them so i'm not like this passion of mine for you know writing my own cookbooks and all of that that i don't need that to pay my bills and to eat <laughs> but i do yeah. that anyway because as you said at the beginning if I can in some way be instrumental in helping one person to not commit suicide because they have bipolar disorder. All of all of what yeah, I do in win. my spare time will be worth it. If I can help one person stop the hell that is bipolar 2 disorder or bipolar 1 disorder or whatever mental health crisis they're in, then all of it will be worth it. And and Ted Absolutely. is the same. Ted doesn't rely on selling the keto diet right to make a living. He works as a family practice doctor. He does that. All of this he does for free. I mean, he has a book. Uh, but he only he only made the book because people were begging him for a book. So he wrote the book, <laughs> but he, he I think it's print on demand. So he only charges what the book costs to print. It's not like he doesn't need you to buy yeah. his book. <laughs> but yeah. the information is all still there. Those are the people you want to seek yeah. out. I love it. I love it. Well, Carrie, wow, that's been a blast. There's a lot here, and. I am so glad for people. There's hope for a lot of people. You know, every time I have someone on who has this incredible story like you have, it's such a treat for a lot of people because I'm I'm I makes me happy because one person, at least one person, will come across this and say, Hey, maybe that person has the same story like you. And you know, if you could really help them speed up the process of healing is great or maybe they know somebody who is struggling this will really be instrumental for a lot of people that's a really 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 good point is that a great way if you have someone that you want to talk about keto to but you don't know how to do it and you know often we don't listen to the people closest to us a great way that you can introduce it to someone is 
by sending them a link to this podcast or sending them a link mm -hmm. to my talk at KetoCon 17 yeah. because it's just it's a lot less it feels a lot less pushy to people when you're saying, mm -hmm. hey, not I think you should do this, but hey, I saw this talk yeah. and I thought of you, you may find it useful. So linking, driving your folks that you're concerned about to resources like this instead of trying to persuade them yourself is a very, very effective way of, of putting something in front of someone that they can then decide would be helpful for them. I'm so grateful for you, Carrie. Thank you so much once again for sharing your story here with our listeners. And uh, we hope we bring you back again, maybe sometime in the, in the next year or so. Um, yeah, I would love back that. And check in with you again. All right. That would uh, be great. All right, guys. Check out kerrybrown.com in the description box below. Carrie has recipes, cookbooks, passionate about health, helping or, or passionate about mental health and, and dedicating, raising awareness about mental health issues. And so, Carrie, thank you so much. Subscribe to the Ketones and Coffee podcast today and never miss an episode. <laughs>